الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا إذا تداينتم بدين إلى أجل مسمى فاكتبوه وليكتب بينكم كاتب بالعدل رب الشحل صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي آمين يا رب العالمين There are sometimes some places in the Quran where Allah talks about um, you know, certain, certain concepts that we just pass over because we're so focused on one thing, the primary subject, uh, and we just want to derive the main conclusions from what Allah is saying, and we overlook the way in which Allah said it. And sometimes the way in which Allah says things and the small phrases that he adds to the speech just completely change your perspective on how you should view certain subjects. I know that sounds abstract. I'll try to make it very, very direct now. You know, everybody has a concept of I am learning deen or I am learning dunya. So when they're learning science or if they're learning biology, if they're learning, you know, medicine or if they're learning, uh, you know, accounting or finance or something like that, they're learning dunya. And if they're studying hadith and fiqh and sharia and Arabic and tajweed and all of these things, then they're studying what? They're learning deen, right? And... We do this all the time. Like my, my work is dunya and my time in the masjid is deen, right? So we separate deen and dunya, deen and dunya all the time. We, we use this terminology, right? And so what happens then when you keep doing this and you keep using that kind of language is you develop the idea that certain things you do in, in a day, 24 hours, certain things you do are beneficial for your akhirah and certain things you do are only beneficial for your but actually, the, the concept of Islam is very powerful. It's very beautiful. The concept of Islam is that we are abd. We are slaves of Allah. And a slave is not a slave for certain hours. By definition, a slave is not the same as a worshiper. A worshiper is someone who does worship. So we were worshippers when we were upstairs making salah. You understand? But when salah was over, we were still slaves. Now the word for worshiper is abid. Abid. But the word for slave is abd. So we are abid, meaning worshippers, at certain times. You know, when I go to hajj, I'm abid. When I go to salah, I'm abid. When I'm reciting Quran, I'm abid. But when I'm driving my car, I'm still what? I'm still abd. When I'm, when I'm getting married, I'm still abd. When I have children, I'm still abd. When I'm going to work, I'm still abd. When I'm taking a vacation, I'm still abd. I may not be a abd at the time, but I'm still a abd. But now the thing is, We've done, turned this conversation into deen and dunya. In other words, unless you're a abid, you're really not doing anything for your afterlife. You're not doing anything that makes Allah happy. I, if, not, if you really want to do something for your deen, then you have to be on the abid side of things. You have to be a worshiper. You have to be learning, teaching, in a masjid, in a halaqa, in a setting. You have to be doing these things. Other things are all for your dunya. Now, the thing is, Let's just change the framework of our education first. This happened to me while I was in Australia. A young man came up to me after my program and said, you know, Ustad, I feel really bad. Why do you feel bad? Well, I'm studying accounting. Well, I guess you should feel bad. But, um, but explain more why you feel bad. But he feels bad because um, he wants to be studying deen instead. And instead he's studying accounting, which is dunya. So I said, why do, why do you don't, why do you, you don't like accounting? You don't like the subject? I mean, I understand that just, if you don't like accounting, that just means you're a normal human being. No, he goes, I love accounting. I really like it. I love, I love the math. I love doing the numbers. I enjoy it. But I just feel bad that I'm doing this to make my career better and get a job and get married and make my parents proud and all of this. All of that is dunya. What am I doing for deen? I'm just doing all of this for dunya. You understand the question, right? And a lot of people feel that way. They have a successful career. You know, they're an executive or they're getting an MBA or they're getting a PhD. And they're not getting a PhD in Hadith or Sharia. They're getting a PhD in microbiology. They're getting a PhD in psychology. They're getting a PhD in history, something. And they're like, well, this is just worldly. You know, it has nothing to do with my afterlife. The way the Quran shatters this unfortunate concept. By the way, this concept is a new concept. This is not an old concept. This is a new development. It's a, it's a result of secularism. And the idea of secularism is to separate the worlds of mor morality and education from the rest of life. So your spiritual life and your moral life has not, and it should be one thing. 
and education and public sphere, everything else should be separated. Those two worlds should not coexist together. Okay? So who you are at business and who you are at the masjid are two different things. This is business. Don't bring the masjid into this. You know? Or this is, this is a university. Don't bring religion into this. Or for example, you'll have companies, even in the Muslim world, sometimes you have, for example, American companies. And you know, America is known for uh, freedom of speech, but only in America. <laughs> You know, it's known for some freedom of speech. When they said they'll set up a company somewhere in like the Arab world somewhere and they'll create a compound. Inside the compound, you pretend you're in America. And inside that compound, you can't talk about your religion. <laughs> what? And you, you can't really openly pray and you can't really do this or you can't really, do, wait, what is, it? what? I thought freedom of expression, freedom of speech, you could do whatever you want. No, 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 not inside this compound. We don't tolerate religious discussions here. Really? Uh... So what happens then is this idea, this extreme idea of separating your religious life and your, your life of ibadah from your life of your career. And we, you know, for the most part, the world, not just one country or another country, the world has experienced some form of secularization or another. So the way that the average Muslim is secularized, even if they're raised in a Muslim country, even if they heard Adhan their entire life, even if they're, whether they're in Pakistan or they're here or they're in Bangladesh or they're in Australia or they're in America, it doesn't matter. You know what's happened with us? What's happened with us is when you go to, when you go to college, right? Uh, why are, what's your motivation for going to college? It's to get a good degree so you can get a good job. That's your motivation, which of course equals dunya, right? But then you have this guilt, I'm going to do all these things for my dunya. I've become a techie, I've become a programmer, I've become a doctor, I've become an architect, but I haven't done anything for my dunya. Now I need to make some time for... Salah, I need to make some time for, I need to do Hajj, I need to start learning some Arabic, memorize Quran, I need to start taking care of my deen. Right? So what happens is people swing one way, then they swing the other way. And then a lot of people quit their career. They just quit their career. I just want to do something for Islam. I don't want my career anymore. Forget it. What I want to share with you in this small expression, this is an ayah about loans. And in Medina, in the Prophet's time, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, most people were not literate. Most people did not know how to read and write. Starting with our own Prophet ﷺ, he didn't know how to read and write. Now, when Allah revealed uh, guidance for business transactions, which is what happens in Surah Al-Baqarah, how do you do business transactions? What are the ethics or the morals of business transactions? Particularly, he highlighted a complicated business transaction. And a complicated business transaction is not like when you go to the store and buy a Kit Kat. Because when you go to the store and buy a Kit Kat, you give some money, you get the Kit Kat, it's done. But when you have a complicated business transaction, you sign a contract. You make a down payment first. Then the services are being provided. And when the services are done, then you'll make the rest of the payment. You know, that's more complicated. Or you've taken a loan. And the loan is for this property or whatever it is. And you have to make the loan payments over time. Right? And some complications can arise in between. Or there might be an, a conflict between the lender and the, and the borrower. There's some problems might arise. This is not simple situations. These are complicated situations. Now the thing is, if I borrowed money from you, if I borrowed $100 from you, or 100 ringgits for you, or actually nowadays 400 ringgits from you, and said, oh, don't worry, I'll, just, I'll pay you back next week. I, I got you next week. You come back to me next week, hey, so uh, did I say next week? I, th I thought I said two weeks. No, I, I'm pretty sure you said next week. Really? I could have sworn I said two weeks. Okay, here's your 200 back. Wait, no, no, I gave you 400. Are you sure you gave me 400? I, I was pretty sure you gave me 200. No, I, think it, I don't think I would have taken 400. I think 300 at the most. Even if I'm not a liar and a cheater, what can fail? My memory can fail, and my memory usually fails in a way that saves me money. <laughs> right, that's <laughs> consciously or subconsciously. My memory fails me in a way that I want to extend the deadline. Not pay you ahead of time, but pay you later, isn't it? So if you're going to have, you know, tadayantum bidaynin ilajalim musamma, if you're going to take a business loan transaction until a set deadline, faktubuhu, then document it. Allah says, write it down. Don't take loan agreements without having proper 
documentation. So you should have legitimate documentation even when you're taking a personal loan. Of course, banks and things like that, they do a lot of due diligence and they do their homework and they make you sign 85,000 papers and you know, like they, they, here's what you have to sign. Okay. You know, and you don't know which which one signs off your leg and which one signs off your left eye or something. You're just signing because you're not going to read any of that, you know. But anyway, but among personally among family, friends and things like that, you might give a loan. And you just say, it's a favor, don't worry about it. Just, you know, I know you'll pay me back next year. No, don't do that. You should still what? Write it down. You should still have some documentation, right? Now, the pro problem with this instruction in Medina was what? Most people don't know how to write. فَلْيَكْتُبْ بَيْنَكُمْ كَاتِبٌ بِالْعَدْلِ Then a writer should be writing this down among you. Some writer, unless it's katibun, a writer. He doesn't say a believing writer. He doesn't say a person of taqwa. He just says a person who knows how to write. Now the person who knows how to write, I mean, he receives an education not in the, with the Prophet He doesn't, he didn't learn to write from the Prophet Because the Prophet himself does not know how to write. So he got his education, the writer got his education from some other source. And I would argue an un-Islamic source, a secular source. Didn't he? And without that writer, you would not be able to fulfill this ayah. Because the ayah requires a writer. And this writer got his uh, secular education elsewhere. But this writer says, uh, you know, I don't want to write it down for you. I'm busy. But Medina is not very many filled. It's not filled with writers, people who are able to write. So the few people who can write. Now, you, you've heard the concept of jury duty. Right? Well, you're, you're called into court as a, as a responsibility of your citizenship. Well, the few people who were capable of writing were now called upon to say if there is a business transaction and you are being asked to write, then you shouldn't refuse. You should come and write it down because it's your civic duty to help the people who want to make business transactions because they're not capable of doing it. Right? So Allah says, وَلَا يَعْبَ كَاتِبٌ No writer should refuse. And yaktuba to write things down. Now this is the part that really gets me. Kama allamahullahu fal yaktub. No writer should re refuse writing things down, just as Allah had taught him. So he should write it down. Wait, Allah didn't. He didn't learn from the Prophet. He didn't learn from the angel Jibril. He learned from some place how to write, some other place. And what did he learn to write? Business contracts, accounting, finance, isn't it? Which we today call a secular field, isn't it? And Allah's language is the way Allah taught him. Kama Now if you look at the word allama in the Quran to teach, you know, Allah says, Wa Allah, ma lam takunu ta'lamun. Allah is teaching you and Allah knows everything. Allah teaches you what you couldn't possibly have known yourselves. Allah says, al Quran. He taught the Quran. And now He says, He taught the accountant how to write the language of accounting and finance and business transactions. He, on the one hand, talks about He taught revelation. And now He's talking about teaching business agreements. Why? Because Allah is now making all knowledge, all human knowledge. So long as it benefits society in some way, all of it is sacred to Allah. Knowledge itself is sacred to Allah. And He takes credit for it Himself. You may have learned from your teacher. You may have learned, for example, the language of science from your teacher. Who may have learned it from his teacher. Who may have learned it from his teacher. And you keep going further back and you're going to end up at the first human being. Adam alayhi salam. And Adam alayhi salam did not know any words until Allah taught him names for all things. Allama Adam al-Asma. I've said this several times. I'll repeat myself just because it ties into this concept. Every subject you study, whether you're studying, you know, the language of, if you're studying science or history or politics, whatever you're studying, every subject has terminology. If you're studying grammar, it has terminology. Yeah, a lot of terminology, right? If you're studying tafsir, it has terminology. If you're studying you know, finance, it has its own terminology. If you're studying programming, it has its own terminology, isn't it? 
And what is terminology? Certain special words that have a special definition, isn't it? That's what they are. And at every textbook, at the end, there's a glossary of terms. Because you need to be familiar with these terms. Now, terminology, names for things, is in Arabic, al-asma. And these names came about from previous things. You know, we had more basic names for things. As our knowledge advanced, we used those basic elements and created more advanced names, and then created more advanced names, and created more advanced names, isn't it? So terminology keeps getting more and more and more what? Advanced. So we have names for more and more and more things. So keep going back. We keep naming new, new and newer and newer things. You keep going back, there are lesser and lesser names, lesser and lesser names, lesser and lesser names, until you go far back enough, it's Adam alayhi salam, and Allah says, Allah taught him terminologies for all things. Allah taught him the names for al asma'a kullaha. In other words, every science that is made up of any terminology is that actually a great, 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 great grandchild of the same vocabulary that was once given to who? Adam alayhi salam, which means all of it is revealed by Allah. All of it. All knowledge and science that human beings discover is actually inspired to the human beings. Kama allamahu Allah, as Allah had taught him. I made it a point to, to share this concept with you because you don't have to feel bad about this area of science or you know, the area of social sciences, the area of history, whatever you are studying. You don't have to feel bad that it's not deen. It's knowledge granted to the human being. If you're studying architecture, does that benefit society? Absolutely. If you're studying public administration, does that benefit society? Absolutely. Does it benefit people? Yeah, sure. If you're studying business, can it benefit people? Absolutely. These fields are essential, they're beneficial. As a matter of fact, I look back at my own career and I realize I'm, I made a transition out of the technology industry into what I do now, this crazy thing we call Bayina. Right? This is, I made this jump. And before I was doing this, uh, for almost a decade, I was in the technology industry. I got a job full-time working in the tech industry while I was in college. So I, I used to work full-time and go to college part-time, right? And by the time I graduated, I, I was already a, uh, offered like a d department director position at a company. Alhamdulillah. And I used to be a design director. So I, I was big on like front-end design and you know, UI and graphic design, that sort of thing. That was my area, right? And so when I left all of it, and you know, in, in early 2000s, it was a dot-com bust and all these companies were laying off people. Well, I was, yeah, laid off, you know? And then I decided to do something with Arabic and maybe put some, just, you know, take whatever notes I had and put them online somewhere and this and that. But I couldn't, I didn't have the money to hire a graphic designer or, you know, uh, somebody who can write the code for me and do the JavaScript for me and back in the day, HTML for me, all this stuff. I didn't know that. Any, you know who did that? I did. I did it myself. But I couldn't have done it if I didn't have previous background. If I didn't have my career background, I would not be able to put together a dot com and put together the study materials and put together the advertising materials and put together the resources that I needed to actually teach a class at a masjid. Because I didn't have any outside help, it was just myself. Right? So what I learned before, had I not known it, we wouldn't be sitting here. We wouldn't be sitting here. So I don't look, at, look back at that career and that job and that position and those opportunities as, oh, that was dunya and this is deen. Not at all. As a matter of fact, I look at that as the, fundam the essential, the essential tarbiya that Allah allowed me to learn that allowed me to do what I'm doing now. It's not a waste. And that's the view we have to have of our education and our experiences. No experience is a waste. No learning is a waste. No job is a waste. It's a waste when you don't make advantage of it. When you don't take advantage of it. Everything Allah will give you is an opportunity. And you have to use that opportunity for something better, something good. So long as you're doing that, you're good. Don't get caught up in this deen versus dunya thing. And there's one final note on this, which you might not like to hear, but I have to say, uh, is people say, I want to do this for the sake of Allah. I want to do everything for the sake of Allah. And I say, that's impossible. Huh? If you want to have sincerity, if you want to be sincere, what does sincerity mean? You do things for the sake of Allah. Ah, uh, no. Sorry. You can't say that. That means you don't have sincerity because everything you do should be for 
the sake of Allah. Let me let me ask you this. Famous hadith. The Prophet ﷺ, uh, describes a man, uh, uh, a man who had committed many, many sins. Many sins. And he sees a dog that's dying of thirst. And he's about to drink himself. And he gives the dog the drink. And then he died. The man died. Where did he go? He went to Jannah because he showed mercy to the dog, yeah? Now, I think about that hadith and I ask myself, did he give the dog the drink for the sake of Allah? Did he, before he fed the dog, say, Ya Allah, this is not for the dog. Because I, I personally don't even like dogs. This is for your sake. Sincerely for you. Now I'm going to give the dog. Is that what happened? Why did he give the dog drink? He felt bad for the dog. He felt mercy. He sincerely felt mercy for the dog. He had sincerity. What we've done is we've taken the word sincerity and made it what? Sincerity for? The sake of Allah. Sincerity approved by Allah is not the same as sincerity for the sake of Allah. There's all kinds of sincerity. I have sincerity to my wife. But that's not for the sake of Allah. That's for her. I have sincerity to my mom. I love her. But I don't love her for the sake of Allah. If you tell your mom, I love you for the sake of Allah, you know what that means? Had it not been for Allah, I would not have. I mean, seriously, it's so hard otherwise. <laughs> No. I, you know, the, the Prophet says when you smile in the face of your brother, it's sadaqah. Right? Al basma fi wajhi akhika sadaqah. When I see a good friend, I smile. But I don't smile for the sake of. I just, I'm happy to see him. I don't see him. Okay, akhirah. <laughs> if I did that, by the way, if I did that, if I smiled only for the sake of Allah, not because I'm happy to see him, that would not be sincere. That's actually an insincere smile, isn't it? There are some things you and I do purely for the sake of Allah. Ikhlas to Allah. Salah is only for Allah. Hajj is only for Allah. Teaching the deen is only for Allah. You know, like memorizing Quran is only for Allah. Ibadah is only for Allah. Dua is only for Allah. You understand? But then there are some things you do for people. There are some things you do for yourself. I don't exercise for the sake of Allah. I like it. I don't play basketball for the sake of Allah. No, he change your intention. If you do it for the sake of Allah, then basketball will count as ibadah. How do I change my intention? I just like basketball. What do you mean change my intention? I'm taking the shot for the sake of Allah? No. That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make any sense. So what we've done is we've taken these famous words for the sake of Allah and we artificially impose them on everything in life, and then our life becomes super difficult because when you're driving to work and getting paid, you're like, I'm getting paid for the sake of the paycheck. I'm not getting paid for the sake of Allah. I'm insincere. No, you're not. Relax. Al-Kasibu Habibullah. The one who works hard is the beloved of Allah. Why? Because they are sincere to their job. They're sincere to their employer. They're sincere at their work. They don't lie. They don't cheat. They don't steal. Sincerity for the sake of Allah does not mean sincerity only to Allah. Sincerity to people, sincerity to your job, sincerity to your agreements, sincerity to yourself. All of that's acceptable to Allah. All of that is beloved to Allah. Why would the Prophet ﷺ even say something so powerful like a husband and a wife loving each other physically is an act of ibadah? That and no man is thinking about the sake of Allah when he's with his wife. He's not. Let's be honest. And he doesn't, before, hold on a second, let me just make my intention. Nope. It's just, na our deen is natural. It's natural. We make it artificial. We make it difficult to understand and process. The, the, so the, what I'm going back to is some people feel when they have a particular career that career is not for the sake of Allah. Your career should have sincere intentions. You want to do something good with it. You want to benefit someone with it. And that's okay. That's okay. 
there are certain things in which the intention should only be for Allah. Ibadah is the big one. Ibadah should only be for Allah. When you give charity, it should only be for Allah. But by the way, if you give charity because you feel bad for someone, is that acceptable? Yes. There are sometimes acceptable intentions. Acceptable intentions. And that's fine. Like that man who gave charity to the dog. Wasn't that an acceptable intention? Yeah. Yeah. That was completely an acceptable intention. So we have to broaden our perspective on how to think about our religion and not impose on our deen things that Allah and His Messenger وسلم, did not impose. They didn't force those things on us. We did. We took some of these definitions. We gave them an ultra strange meaning and then made our own lives difficult. May Allah Azza wa make us sincere to Him and to people in all things that we do. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thanks for watching guys, I hope you benefited. I'd like to encourage you to actually embark on a comprehensive journey into the Qur'an. I've done a video translation and explanation of the entire Qur'an. It's called Qur'an cover to cover. I'd like you to check it on at Bayina TV. Just do a little bit of it every day and before you know it, you'll have gone through the entire Qur'an and translation with me. Hope you can take part. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.